Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Peter if you're new here. Today I want to share with you guys five quick tips that could improve your wildlife photography. So let's get started. The first one is gonna be about lighting. Photography is all about light essentially. So you have to take advantage of good light and even bad light and you have to get to know the limitations of your camera, what kind of lighting conditions are most suitable for a specific shoot. Normally you would wanna go out early in the morning or late in the afternoon, early evening, when the light is beautiful, soft. But if you don't have the opportunity to shoot during golden hour, then you can also take advantage of, for example, backlighting. The most optimal lighting conditions come on overcast days. So definitely try and shoot as much on overcast days as possible because the lighting is gonna be beautiful, soft and even the clouds essentially function as giant diffusers so definitely take advantage of that. I took this in-flight shot of a rainbow lorikeet a few years ago. It must have been around 6 p.m. The light was really nice and soft. This image demonstrates really well how dramatic and beautiful backlit shots can look. You can see the transparent wings of this Eurasian coot scooting across the water. All those water droplets caused by the splash look pretty amazing. I took this portrait of a little pied cormorant on a very overcast day. It was a foggy morning, which helped create this very even, very soft lighting. Next one is gonna be about exposure settings. Try to use the lowest ISO possible while maintaining maximum sharpness. This takes quite a bit of practice and experimentation. This also depends on the focal length that you are using, but you are able to handhold the camera or you're using a tripod for example or the quality of the image stabilization the optical is or the in-body image stabilization of your camera that combination can result in crazy amount of is up to eight stops i believe in the new mirrorless systems for example with the rf uh, lenses normally you would want to use the reciprocal rule let's say i normally use my 100 to 400 millimeter lens on the 400 millimeter telephoto end i would use at least one four hundredth of a second but you can get away with much slower shutter speeds, especially with the aforementioned image stabilization. The nature of your subject definitely plays a role as well. Fast moving still subjects versus very fast moving subjects will dictate how high you have to go in terms of ISO. Normally I would shoot wide open, but if your subject gets a little bit too close, then you have to step down to F7.1 or F8, just to make sure that the entire subject is in focus. Another really important factor to take into consideration is exposing to the right. You always have to make sure that you expose for the highlights. If you clip the highlights, if the highlights are blown out, you won't be able to recover any detail in them in post. Whereas with the shadows, you can always bump up the exposure and you can always correct and um, compensate for that in post much easier. Today's cameras have amazing dynamic range. With the new mirrorless cameras, the EVF can display the histogram simultaneously while you are shooting, so that makes your job much easier as well. As I said before, still subjects are the easiest to shoot because you can lower the shutter speed and the ISO for maximum detail with the best signal to noise ratio. With fast moving subjects, such as this rainbow lorikeet that was about to land on the Fijoa tree in our backyard, I had to use a shutter speed of 1 3,200th of a second at an ISO of 3,200. Exposing to the right is extremely important, especially with subjects such as this great egret. You wouldn't wanna have those beautiful white feathers blown out because you wouldn't be able to recover any kind of detail in post. This next tip is gonna be about the importance of the background. Try to move around your subjects, try to find a decent background that will allow you to separate your subject from the background. Ideally, you would want to have the background from your subject as far away as possible because it creates more separation. In most cases, this results in much stronger frames overall. Faster glass definitely helps as well because if you can shoot wide open, the bokeh is gonna be much more beautiful. Here is an example of a cluttered background. The branches and the foliage, all those leaves surrounding this beautiful eastern rosella as it was foraging, doesn't look as visually appealing, it looks a bit distracting. Whereas with this shot where the subject separation from the background is much more well defined, it just looks much stronger overall. My fourth tip is gonna be about experimenting with angles, shooting from unusual perspectives. Normally you would wanna be at eye level with your subject. This creates a much stronger connection between the viewer and the wildlife subject. In general, these type of images are the strongest, but you also don't wanna be afraid of experimenting with unusual angles. Sometimes it creates much more visual drama as well. Normally the oblique high angle and low angle shots are what you would like to avoid. For example, when you are looking up at a bird perched on a branch, those kind of shots tend to be the least impressive in my opinion. Here is an example for shooting at eye level. As you can see, it allows the viewer to see the world 
from the way, from the perspective the animal does. And overall, it creates a much stronger connection, a much more intimate connection between the viewer and the subject. By the way, this was a magpie lag or also known as PV that I captured in our backyard. It was rather raucous and quite aggressive. They tend to be quite territorial, especially during the mating season. Here are a couple of examples for shooting from unusual angles. On the right, you can see a beautiful black swan. Again, I had to get down really low because I wanted to be at eye level to create this really strong connection. I really liked the tones in the background and also the shape of its neck as it was bending forward, foraging. There was a little bit of catch light in its eye. I also like the fact that I managed to capture intricate details of its beak. You can see those amazing serrated edges that help them, aid them in catching foods, aquatic plants, seeds and insects. On the left you can see a top-down high-angle shot I took of a dusky moorhen. I wanted to capture this aggressive look in its eye and it looked quite amazing. Also shooting from this angle allowed me to capture those beautiful tonal transitions in its beak. This is an example for shooting from suboptimal angles. You see these kind of shots from a lot of beginner photographers. On rare occasions I still tend to shoot these images but only with species that I had not captured before just for documentation purposes. My last tip is going to be about composition. Always make sure that your shot is well balanced. It usually means that the more simplified, the more minimalistic a shot is, the better. It's much easier for the viewer to identify your subject in the scene, for example. You can never go wrong by using the rule of thirds. Use symmetry to your advantage. Use negative space. You can also fill your entire frame with your subject for maximum detail. Or if you want to zone in on a specific part, highlight a specific characteristic of your animal. For example, when you're shooting the texture of the plumage of the bird, that can create really beautiful, interesting abstracts as well. Visual balance is about a kind of minimalistic approach where you try to eliminate as many distracting elements from the frame as possible. This is a heavily cropped image that I took of two white egress perched on a dead tree. The reason why I decided to crop it uh, this heavily is because there were too many uh, other birds in awkward positions, in awkward locations and also too many branches all over the place. You always want to make sure that especially around the edges of the frame there are no distracting elements. Those kind of elements can draw the attention away from your subject for the viewer and you want to eliminate the chance of that. You probably are aware of the rule of thirds where the image is split evenly into thirds on both the vertical and horizontal axis. In most cases you can't go wrong with this technique. It creates a very pleasing composition when you are placing your subjects at the intersection or nodal points of those dividing lines. I really love this image that I took of a grey-headed flying fox as it was yawning. This one was captured at Yarraband Park where they tend to roost. They have a colony of about 10,000 during the summer. With this particular shot I also love that the wings were essentially parallel with the branch. That looked quite cool in my opinion. You can observe symmetry everywhere in nature. It's extremely prevalent. Symmetry occurs when two halves of the scene are essentially identical and balance each other out. I took this backlit shot of a beautiful butterfly on a small lavender field in Hungary. I took this shot of two black swans with my telephoto lens at 400mm because I wanted to compress the space as much as possible. Negative space really does help create context in this instance. I love the fact that those two swans were facing away from each other. That is the main reason why I placed them right in the center of the frame. The fog enveloping the lake and my subjects and also those two parallel lines, those two ripples in the water looked pretty cool in my opinion. I also went with very muted colors in this frame because I wanted to look everything as if it was a painting. This is an example about filling the frame. I captured this shot of this beautiful European red fox sniffing the air while being half asleep a few hundred meters from where I live at the local reserve. This is an introduced species here in Australia and unfortunately they pose quite a bit of threat to the native wildlife. The population density is around 20-25 uh, per square kilometer in Melbourne which is quite high. I took this extreme stack macro shot of the beautiful patterns that I found on the wings of a dainty swallowtail, a butterfly species. It looked quite amazing, all those little scales and the different colors. To me it actually resembles, especially when fully zoomed in, the texture of a carpet for example. This is just a few tips I wanted to share with you. Obviously we could go into much more detail and be more comprehensive, but I think if you are aware of these five basic aspects of wildlife photography, especially if you are new to the genre, it will help you tremendously. I hope you have found these five tips useful, but keep in mind the most important thing that you can do is just keep practicing, keep experimenting, keep failing. That's how you're going to learn the most. Thank you so much again for watching and see you guys very soon in the next one.